Inflation, it's inevitable, right? Every day you wake up, it's a new day, and that means something is gonna be more expensive today than it was yesterday. But is that always the case? Why is this happening? And what exactly is inflation? All of that is part of today's discussion. You see, if you ask 10 different people, they might give you a different interpretation of what inflation is. Some would say that it's the expansion of the currency supply. Others would say when prices are rising. Well, of course, we need to look at these details and we need to simply understand that it's not the terms that we should be aware of. It's really the fact that when we feel it in, in terms of the asset prices, in terms of the, you know, the bills that we pay, these things, the valuation of the currency, are happening and we really need to understand why. Once we start to make all those connections, it's going to make our lives a lot easier when we're trying to make investment choices, when we're trying to make decisions for ourselves and our family. So I'm gonna break down some really good information today and get into and highlight the reasons why we need to be paying attention to the uh, you know M2, the M1, the M3, all of these different ways that they calculate the currency supply. This is very important because when we look at it, they can include one set, but disregard it in another, and it might give an entirely different picture for people. But if you and I are paying attention, we're going to be able to see what others simply don't. So let's get into this breakdown. I'm gonna explain things in depth right here. The recent decline in broad money, also known as M2, should not be necessarily interpreted as an indication of incoming deflation. Instead, a closer examination of the components of broad money reveals that inflationary forces are still present. Factors such as underweights in real assets, low long-term yields, and inverted yield curves suggest that the market is underestimating the long-term effects of persistent and entrenched inflation. Despite posting its first year-on-year -year decline in 60 years, it's important to note that M2 and its narrow money counterpart, M1, are often misunderstood in terms of their impact on the economy. It's often mistaken that there is a direct correlation between changes in M2 and changes in inflation. However, just because two variables appear to be related, it does not mean that there is a casual relationship. In reality, a third variable is likely influencing both M2 and inflation. Upon closer examination, it becomes clear that there is not a strong relationship between M2 and inflation. It's important to note that M2 is countercyclical, which is a fundamental aspect that is often overlooked. The largest component of M2 is savings deposits, unlike demand deposits, which are current account money and deposit money created for loans, money tends to be moved into savings deposits during times of risk aversion or perceived slowing growth. Conversely, money is often moved out of savings deposits and into current account during periods of increased economic activity and optimism. The increase in savings deposits in late 2020 was an early indication that strong inflationary pressures were on the horizon in 2021. In the past, there was a clear distinction between M1, which primarily consisted of demand deposits, and M2, which was mostly composed of savings deposits. However, in May 2020, the Federal Reserve decided to include savings deposits in the the other liquid deposits component of M1 following an amendment to the Fed's Regulation D making savings and demand deposits more interchangeable. But despite this change, we can still track savings deposit data in this chart, we, which shows that the savings deposits data reversed and pushed forward by 12 months. It is clear that it leads the inflation trend as measured by the Cleveland Fed's median CPI. The fact that growth in savings deposits has not yet begun to rise suggests that the underlying inflationary forces have not yet subsided. Headline inflation is likely to continue to fall due to lagged impact on the commodity price falls and base effects, but the contraction in the M2 is not giving any signal that the inflationary regime is coming to an end. Now that was certainly a mouthful, but the point here is simply that when you look at broad money and you start to really break it down on what it is, as I explained here in depth, it starts to make sense. But this is simply one level, one understanding of it. This doesn't factor in central bank assets. 
This doesn't factor in other countries. When you look at this on a global level, it's a different perspective entirely. But in this one narrow point of view, it certainly does make sense. So I wanted to bring that to you. However, in future videos, I'm going to explain the central bank assets. I'm going to look at other countries' assets, and we're going to take this all in so that we can understand what's really happening here today. Because everywhere I look, prices are rising on services and on goods. There's nothing that's getting cheaper out there. Yes, you might have an instance where lettuce suddenly triples in price and celery triples in price and eggs are multiplying. Yes, I get that. But the general theme is that today the prices are, let's say, $1.00. Next year, there'll be $2 and then there'll be $4 and then there'll be $8. And we don't really ever see a time in which they go down. This is so important to note because you can look at the monetary supply, whether you want to measure that in M2, whether you want to measure that in central bank assets. And we see it over a period of time in what it has done. And you know that it has expanded to a great degree. This really all began back in 1971, Nixon pulled the world off the gold standard, and as a result, we had an expansion of debt like we've never seen before. Really important to highlight that. If we're going to ignore it, quite frankly, we are simply letting go of a very, very key point, a key piece of detail in history that highlights what we see today. Now, inflation, it's a tricky one, but the point here is we want to take something from this video that we need to hold on to real assets during inflationary periods so that we can maintain our value over long periods of time. But where has the you know, non-inflationary period been? Well, of course, we can see that we haven't had that. We really have not. So regardless, we want to hold on to real assets. We want to build something on our own. We want to have something that is tangible because in these very uh, you know, difficult times and questionable times, we want to have something that is certain. We need that certainty so we could sleep well at night. I hope this makes sense to you. There's a different type of video from the Money GPS. Let me know what you think below. Of course, I'm always trying to bring out new types of videos. If I can try and test things here and there and see what you like to try to get into topics in depth. This is going to lead up into what I call the money mirror method, which I'm still conceptualizing. I'm still working on how to deliver that properly. I don't want to mess that video up because this is huge. And this is one component of that. So I want to thank you for being here. If you want more of the latest and greatest, hit that subscribe button down below so I can see you tomorrow. Take care.